<laughs> That's funny. All right, so I'm going to show you how to install the development kit because uh, these were already installed on the on the lab computers. I did this manually, uh, but obviously at home you couldn't finish installing Rails if you didn't have the dev kit installed. So on the same place where we downloaded the Ruby installer, which was this one, which we did yesterday, uh, on that same page we're going to come down to the dev kit and is, and download that guy. And you don't need to do this here at school, so. Shouldn't have to, no. Yeah, you don't have to. All right, here's our downloading and our scanning. All right, I chose the wrong one. I wasn't paying attention. There's three on DevKit. Depending on your computer, uh, we want the 64-bit version for Ruby 2. That's what we want. So we want this DevKit Ming W64, yada, yada. So we want that guy. Yeah, my office computer's 32 bit. <laughs> I know, before. All right, so we're going to run this file, this dev kit, and it asks you where you want to extract it. So uh, I might as well go through this whole thing and extract it. I do it on the C drive into a directory called dev kit. All right, so I create a directory called DevKit. I extract it to there, and once that's done, we go and we look at uh, the, where is it? This is the, is that it? Yeah, all right. So. We click on, uh, sorry, this Ruby installer development kit link on the same page where we downloaded the dev kit. And this is on GitHub, and you need to read this. But basically, uh, it tells you how to install it from these installation directions here. So you download the dev kit. You extract it. We open up a, a window, because we're going to do this all in the command line. So let's do this. Uh, smaller, and we need to change directories to this dev kit. So where was, where was it that I extracted it? So I have to say C colon first to change volumes. Then I say CD dev kit, and there I'm done. So I'm, that's what I get. So it downloaded it. I extracted the files, and then I'm going to run this installation script. So I've changed directories into it. I'm going to run this. Ruby space dk.rb init. Ruby space dk.rb init. All right? So it creates a file called config.yaml. Y-M-L. So we can look at that file, and we'll just use Notepad to look at config.yaml. And there's the file. Isn't that cool? So all this is is a file that tells uh, the dev kit where your Ruby is installed. So running that config, uh, db dkrb dot, blah, dk dot rb dot space init, creates this file that goes out and finds where your Ruby is installed. So if you install something, this directory will probably be different. You'll have a Ruby 20197 or something like that, right? So that's correct. We want to make sure we only have one line here. We'll say, okay, that looks correct. Mine had the 200 plus the 193. Yeah, so I would delete the 193, delete the other line so you only have the one, and save the file. And then once we're done, uh, this is optional. We can say rubydk.rbreview. We'll just do that just for fun. And it says, uh, nothing. So it changes me. Yeah, this tells it where it's at, right? Ruby 200. 
Then I'm going to do ruby dk.rb install. And it does all the installation it needed. I've already done it, so you might get different errors. And then, finally, we do step five, which tests this installation. So what I want to do is try to install a gem that requires the dev kit. And JSON is one of them that is uh, required by Rails as well. So I'm going to copy that piece. Oops, I got a right click paste. And it's going to go out and try to find a JSON tem gem. And then it says building native extension. So it's actually running the C compiler on my local box and converting it. Okay, so that's fine. They're having trouble with some Unicode stuff, but you can ig ignore these uh, errors here because those are just documentation errors. Okay, so it worked, it ran, and then we can do a little test to see if JSON actually worked by testing this. So I'll copy this, paste this, and it comes back with 42. So that's good, that's a correct, uh, everything is fine. All right, any questions on that? Everybody does. All, all real, why? You don't remember why? Did you take my 149 class? What is the answer to life, the universe, and everything? 42. What's the question to the answer to the life, the universe, and everything? You, I don't have true geeks in here. What's wrong with you? What's the question that came up with the answer 42? No. The proper question that they, they thought was right. Do you remember that one? What is 9 times 6? Or 6 by 9? What is 9 times 6 or 6 times 9? What, what is 6 times 9? 54. That's wrong, right? So the basic fundamental of construction in the universe is flawed. That's what they said. That's basically it. Whew. Anyway, uh, there's some, you can do some fun things with... With with base 13, you have to draw it up. Uh, with base 13, that 42 is actually 54 in base 13. You could do that on your own. Anyway, beyond beyond where we're at right now. Yeah, that was all recorded. Wasn't that fun? So great stuff. Yeah. All right. So let's now do what we did yesterday in Ruby Mine. Uh, and, and create a new project in RubyMine. And we'll actually try to create a controller and a view. Now, just a review, uh, what does the model deal with in the MVC architecture? Yeah. Data, right? All of the database interaction is done through the model. All of your business logic is done in the model, like calculating interest rates and things like that would be done in the model. What does the view do? User interface. User interface. Okay, that displays the actual uh, HTML back to the browser. That's what puts it all together and creates a page. And the controller? Connects the two together. Connects the two together, all right? It's the brains of the operation, and it connects the two together. All right, so inside of RubyMine, we started, I want to create a new project. I'm going to select not an empty project. I'm going to create a Rails application instead. All right, and I'm going to put this under, uh, I think I had a directory that I used, didn't I? Um, oh, let's do uh, CIS 284 fall 13. How about that? Well, uh, duh. CIS 2.84 fall 13. All right, we'll create their folder. Fall 13. I want 2.84. All right, and I'll change my project name to lecture. How about that? All right, we'll say OK. And then it's going to ask me what type of version of all of this that I want. Now, I hopefully have already installed Rails, and you should have Rails 4.0 listed here. 
If not, you're going to go need to you're going to need to go install Rails for it. So we want 4.0. That's correct. We want Ruby 2. We're not going to use any template. We're going to use the jQuery JavaScript library, and I want you to pre-configure for selected database, and I want you to select SQLite 3. All right, pre-configure for SQLite 3. Say, okay. Uh, we'll replace this window, and now I have my project. Now notice, it does the same thing that we did yesterday from the command line by typing Rails new project name. It created all of these files for us, and it's running the bundle install, which we'll talk about later. And creates my project for me. Creates all kinds of text files and Ruby files and all kinds of stuff. So all of this was created with that one command. Get rid of these little things here. Uh, so there are lots of files and folders that we're going to deal with, and you'll learn them as we go throughout the quarter. Uh, but they are they are many. Uh, the database, this is the configuration file for the database, which we can just close for now. We're not going to deal with that. Uh, and it, most of our coding is going to be done in this folder called app. Now, one of the things that developers like about Rails is that it, it's very opinionated. The, the guy that wrote it is very opinionated to start with, but he enforces his opinion on the development of this platform. So what, what do we get out of somebody being very opinionated? Structure, right? I get very specific structure. I get everything is created the same. If I walk into somebody that's already producing Rails, I know exactly where to find the controllers. They're always in this controller folder in the app folder. I can always go and find my way through a project Whereas PHP, for instance, is there any structure at all? People can write their code however they want. And they've got files included by included by included 14 levels deep, and you have no idea where things are. So I highly recommend if you take over a website from somebody and it's in PHP, charge them like 10 times what you're normally going to charge <laughs> them. And then convert it to Rails and you'll be safe. But anyway, so uh, we can now run this from RubyMine, just like we did yesterday, we did a, how did we start our server in the command line? Do you remember? It was Rails with the S after it. Rails space S for server, or Rails space server, all spelled out. So if we want to run this, we come up here to the run, and we're going to run the development version of Rails. Now, Rails comes in three versions, automatically having three different databases so that I don't uh, cloud my database with a bunch of test information. Whereas when I taught PHP, I, d I made you guys have two different websites. Remember that? Two different SQL databases um, so that your database, your testing database, didn't uh, clutter up your production database. This Rails automatically keeps three environments separate. So if I switch to production, all my test data garbage that I put in there, all my ASDF strings don't end up in my production database. So it's very easy. So I'm going to run development mode. And it's going to run the server. And this is just like what we saw yesterday. Uh, brooding WebRick is running the, rail, running the Rails web server called WebRick. And now I can actually open up my browser and go to localhost colon 3000, and I should get uh, the same top-level page that I got yesterday once it gets everything loaded. Ah. I do. Localhost. Good eye. I bet it didn't save my uh, proxy settings. So I'm going to have to go switch these again. Advanced. Network. Land settings. 
Don't use a proxy server. Really? Oh, because I hit reload. Yay, it's a miracle. All right, so I have uh, uh, localhost 3000. This is the initial screen that I get. And you see that my server log is displayed in a window down below. So with one integrated environment like this, I have access to all aspects of my server. I can look at the logs. I can look at source code files and everything all in this one place. So it's pretty useful. So I can click on my application environment and make sure everything's correct, especially the database adapter. We want to make sure that's correctly installed and running. And also from this page, it has links to the Rails guides, which I highly recommend you read. Uh, the API for Rails, which we'll be going back and forth to a lot. Um, and uh, that's it. All right. Any questions on that? We have a basic Rails project set up now. How did you do the local What do you mean? Uh, did you start your server over here? Did you run it? Mm -hmm. It's running, so you can see that web rick over here. Oh, it's still it takes a it takes a minute to get started. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. What, website? what website? What are you trying to be a shill here or something? <laughs> we'll get to that. That file that displays all this HTML, like Ryan says, is actually in this directory here called public. And it's called, uh, it's not in there anymore. They took it out in the index.html. I think it might be uh, hard coded. I don't know. It's a good question. It's not there anymore. Yeah, mess with me. Go ahead. All right, so let's move on. We're going to talk about a, a controller and a view, and we'll skip the model for now. So we need to have a controller that receives an incoming request and then outputs information through the view all the way back to the browser. So Rails is also very nice in that it has built-in code generators. It can generate code for us. So if I want to create a controller, let's, uh, I can right click on my app folder here, or any folder actually, and I want to say run under new, run Rails generator. Okay, everybody got that? And I want to run a controller. I want to create a new controller. So I start typing the, the word CON and it comes up on the screen for me. And I can give my controller a name. All right. So our controller, let's say I want this to be called say. I'm going to use, and this is what the book uses, so if you're following the book. And let's add an action name at the same time. All right. So under this action name, I'm going to hit the plus sign and give it a name like hello, all right? And we'll talk about what an action is here in a minute. So my controller name is say, my action name is hello, and I hit OK. Leave everything else uh, checked the same, defaults. OK, it's going to go out. It's going to run some Ruby code that executes and writes Ruby code on the fly. So it created a bunch of new files for me, uh, a controller, uh, it created a route, uh, it created a view, all kinds of tests, it, a it creates a class and everything. Okay, so here is where you need to know classes. I have a say controller that it created for me, and by convention in Rails, everything has some type of a word before the word controller. 
Okay, so whatever I named my controller is before the word controller. Now, what does this symbol mean here? It inherits from. It inherits from, thank you. It inherits from the class called application controller. And remember when we did inheritance last quarter with the zebras and all that stuff, we inherited methods that were provided for us in its parent class. Remember that? So this application controller has tons of methods in it that we get for free. We don't have to write those. It gives us all kinds of information for free. Now inside of this, this is, what is this def hello? It's a method. And in Rails, we call this an action that is taking place on this particular controller. So I'm saying I want to go to the say controller and I want to execute this action called hello. Okay? Now, hello, it, I don't have to do anything in here. And I can go to my browser and try to hit, hit that controller. So the, the way the URLs work now is uh, I type the name of the controller, which is what? Say by itself, say. And the name of the action, hello. So it's an action and a method. An action is a method. All right, so it, it went through the controller and said, oh, hey, you want to execute this hello method. And this method said, passed all of its information on to what? What's the part that displays this information? The view, OK? So if we look on our left here, we have app controllers. We have models. We have some other stuff we're going to skip for now. And we have views. So that's the MVC. So if I look in my views, I see that I have a folder called Say. And it matches the name of my controller. It's very important that these two match because Rail, Ruby and Rails uses this convention to figure out which methods to call. So uh, after it finishes that action, hello, it comes down into the views, into the Say folder, and it executes this file. All right, so we'll show that in a second. Let me get this bigger. This is the HTML that represents the, the, the view for the say hello method. Say controller and the method hello, or the action hello. So if you look at it, my say hello is in H1 tags. And this says, find me in the app view say hello HTML ERB file. So you see exactly. So I can add some stuff here. Hello, Dave. And without doing anything else, just reloading my browser, it reloads all of this. I don't have to stop the server again. I don't have to rerun anything. I just have to reload my browser. Isn't that sweet? No more save. No more save because RubyMind saves automatically when I switch applications. So don't bother going up here and hitting save. Just switch to your browser and reload your browser. Makes it a lot faster to execute. All right, so let's review how that goes. Uh, let me get my uh, PowerPoint up here again. Damn it. All right, so here's my PowerPoint that shows the model view controller paradigm. So the browser makes a request. So in my browser, I requested this URL. And that URL goes through a system called the router, which we'll talk about in a minute. And that sends it on to the controller. And it knows based on this that I need to go to which controller? the say controller, right? That's part of the URL. Uh, so Ruby knows then go to the say controller and look up the method hello and execute that method. Now, my method didn't have anything in it, right? In my actual method, there's nothing here. But 
this is where I can add some code. I can do some stuff in here later. It's just a, a placeholder. Uh, the view is what gets displayed then back out to the browser. So it went from the, br the browser, excuse me, to the controller. Skip the model because I don't have anything that I'm looking for in the model yet. Goes to the view, displays the HTML back to the browser. So we made this loop here. That's all we did. All right, any questions on that? No? All right. So why, the question was asked, why is this hello.html.erb? So ERB is an extension that stands for Embedded Ruby. Embedded spelled E-M-B-E-D-D-Y. E-D-D-E-D. -E -D -D -E -D. There you go, Embedded uh, Ruby. Um, this allows us to run Ruby code inside of this view. I can actually execute Ruby statements inside of this view. So let's try that. To do that, I have to uh, tell Ruby that I'm going to be executing Ruby code, and I use special delimiters around this Ruby code, much like your ASP pages. Everybody here at ASP? Not yet. Uh, ASP has the same delimiters, and they, they actually look like uh, that, I think, in ASP. I don't remember ASP delimiters. All right. So in ERB, we're going to use this symbol here, and I can just do uh, normal ERB, normal Ruby, sorry. So what would 2 plus 2 be if I executed that in Ruby? Six, okay, good. I'm glad you guys are in your math class, good. So two plus two is four, and this equal sign says print that to the screen. Print that to this HTML page at this position. So right here on the page, I want you to print the result of evaluating this expression. So this is a lot like a puts, all right? We do a puts, two plus two, I should get a four on the page. So let's, I don't have to run anything. I just go back to my browser, reload my page, and bada boom, bada bing, I should have a four here. Come on. Isn't that fast? <laughs> Why are we so slow? Yeah. So I finally got four. I had some browser issues here. We'll see if it continues. So it printed a four. Why is it on the same line as Hello Dave up here? Because what is what is what is uh, Rails outputting here? HTML. Uh, HTML does not ignores white space, right? It doesn't care about white space. So if I wanted this to be on its own line, what would I have to add? A br, right? Let's add a break tag, reload my page, hopefully it'll work, and I got a four on my second line here. So you have to remember that I'm outputting HTML here. That's actual HTML. So I can move this anywhere I want. I can put this below my Hello Dave, maybe, and reload my page, and I've got a four Hello Dave. Isn't that great? I can also do while loops. You guys remember while loops or a do loop or a times do loop? So let's do, let's do something like uh, 20 dot or 3 dot times do. And at the end of that, I need to have what? End. And inside of this, now I can do anything I want. I can, no except puts, right? So I can say ho. Okay, so what is going to be printed to the screen? Ho, 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 right? Ho, ho, ho. Green giant. Why is it on the same line? No, why do you have your start and stops like all weird? Without the equal? Well, because this is Ruby code, any Ruby code has to be inside of these special symbols. 
All right, but the outside of that, I can just put text. I can do anything I want inside of these symbols. So it's going to replicate basically printing ho three times here. I could put a, a P tag around this. If you do like two plus two there, is that gonna work or do you need you'll need the sign, right? Right. Right. If I add, if I put this back inside my loop. Yeah. Now aren't you gonna get your hose all on three three different lines? <laughs> yes. Now my hose will be on three different lines, right? You gotta keep your hose and I'll have my <laughs> and it should print my four in between there. So now I've got four hole, four hole, four hole. Three holes and a four. All right? They're whole, it's Christmas. You guys got to get your mind out of the gutter. Okay, so for control structures like this, I do not put the equal sign because what would be the result of printing out the value of three dot times do? Useless, right? Doesn't make sense. I only want to print things that I want to actually print to the screen. So you think of the equal sign as using a puts. The uh, anything else that's a control structure is going to have a, a not an equal sign. But well, what? It's not even the equal sign that's messing with me. It's the the whole is part of the, the do loop. Yep. This line will be printed three times. Anything inside of this is going to be output to the screen three times. Can't get that. Killing ya. So let's look at the actual source code. And you'll see that I actually get the spaces as well. Right? I'm getting all the spaces that were here output to the to the browser as well. But the browser ignores them when they actually show them on the when they render the HTML. Right, the programming is gone because that Ruby code will not run in the browser. So again, Ruby only outputs HTML. That's all it can do. It cannot output code that runs on your browser unless it outputs JavaScript, right? I could output JavaScript here and say uh, uh, script um, document dot write. Uh, hello. <laughs> and if I if I reload that, you'll see my script be output three times, right? If I look at my my script, it should actually write. Maybe not. Yeah, but something wrong with my code, right? I don't know what, but document dot, isn't that right, right? I don't know why it's not right. I'll have to think about that one. Yeah, probably. Probably my script is wrong. Um, but it outputs the, uh, the data. I'm outputting just straight text, straight HTML to the screen. All of these... Uh, Command structures and things are not output to the screen. Uh, what? Lang equals something like this. I don't remember. I rarely write my own JavaScript, so. <laughs> no. Not for that's jQuery only. Pretty sure. Yeah, I'm not. I, I didn't. That wasn't what I was trying to get involved in. So. Language. I don't remember. I'm, I'm making a fool of myself here. So, let's skip that. And I'm recording it. So let's skip that. I'll, I'll figure it out later. Not a big deal. No, I think it has to be uppercase document. I should make you guys do that as a as an assignment. All right, so let's go back and trace this a little bit. God, we're already out of time. Oh my gosh. 
Of course. All right, so this hello, the, the URL comes into the program, comes into the say controller, executes this hello method, which doesn't have anything, any code in it. But the result of all of this, it calls the view, which is my hello say view. And RubyMine has some nice little features. They have this little button on the side of the method. And I click it, it takes me right to the view. If I click this, it takes me back to the action. Because these are very tied closely together. These are tied very closely together. So it makes sense to go back and forth between these all the time. All right, let's do one more thing, because I know you guys are just enraptured by this. Uh, what type of variable is this? It's an instance variable. Very good. See, you didn't forget everything over the summer. I can say yo ho. Now, what type of what type of variable is it? A string now. So, any instance variable in a method in a controller like this, any instance variable in my action hello, is made available to my view. So inside of my view, I can access the value of my at yo. So I can say, inside of here, let's put in an h2 and print out, how would I print out the value of my instance variable? Puts, how do I do puts in ERB? Less than equals the value of yo. That's it. All right, so whatever the value of yo is, is going to be replaced as a string inside of two h2s. So when I reload this guy, bada boom, bada bing, I got yo ho three times. So I was able to define values in my action that are made available to my view. And that's how we're going to get data from the model. I can make a request to my model inside of here to go get data, like give me a list of all my products in my SQL products table, assign it to this variable, and then in my view, I can print all of those out to the HTML. Isn't that sweet? Awesome. It's awesome stuff. Doesn't that cause a lot of problems with security? No. Rails is very secure. Yeah. Well, how do you do a comment? What if someone's the way A comment how? Which comment? So in here, we're dealing with two different types of languages, right? The HTML that we're outputting and the the Ruby language that's in the ERB, the embedded Ruby. So if I want to comment this out and not print the yo, I would put, how do I make a comment in Ruby? A pound sign. So I'm going to put a pound sign before the equal sign. And that, that should comment out that yo. Okay, so it's no longer here. And I won't even see it in the source because it never output it. It did do the H2s, but nothing inside the H2s, all right? So that's how you comment out this. Now, if I wanted to comment out in HTML style, uh, what is the comment in HTML? All right? If I want to comment this all out, I would use that type of a structure. And then I'm going to actually uh, see that uh, comment in the HTML but I'm still not going to see my uh, Ruby comment because I commented it out. Now, what happens if I do that? What do you think is going to happen? Uh, right? Yo-ho comes in. It's inside of a comment on the HTML, but the actual page doesn't have the yo-ho in it, right? The source has it, but HTML blocks it out. So this is one way you can do to do some debugging. You can print out values as comments into your page without screwing up your structure. All right, that's enough for today. Any questions?